Welcome to the History of the Papacy podcast, a podcast about the history of the popes of Rome and Christian Church. Prepare yourself to step behind the ropes and leave the official tour of the story of the popes and Christianity. I'm your host, Steve Guerra, and I thank you for joining me on this journey. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the podcast. That's Steve here again. Before we get started, I would like to send out a very special thanks to our latest patron on patreon.com forward slash history of the papacy, Richard. Richard is joining us at the Antioch level. Thank you so much, Richard, and all of my, all of the patrons on Patreon that help support this show and keep it running. If you want to learn more, you know the way. Go to patreon.com forward slash history of the papacy. Today is, I would say it's a sort of an opportunity. I recorded a quite long episode wrapping up the Decapolis mini series inside of the 10th anniversary series. But unfortunately, the audio was completely unusable. So that was pretty awful. I was not happy after recording for about a good hour and a half, two hours to have that audio be completely unusable. But there is an opportunity in here that I'm going to give you a best of episode today. And I think that I'm enjoying doing some of these what we might call reruns, because in the course of 10 years of podcasting, there's so much content and people jump in in the first episode. Sometimes people jump in in and out of series and they don't even see different new content. So I'm going to use this as an opportunity to give you some of the older content, sort of reintroduce you to it, to the old hats. Maybe you don't remember it. Maybe for the new people, it'll get you to try a new series. So this is the first episode from a series I called The Aryan Century, and it was about 10 episodes, episodes 39 through 48. And I'll put links in the description for these episodes. In this series, we went back and looked at the history of Arianism. Arianism wasn't the first heresy in Christianity, but it was one of the most challenging, and it was really the first heresy that hit the church after the Edict of Milan and all of the things that made Christianity more livable, I guess you might say, more doable in the empire. So enjoy this episode. If you like this episode, tell a friend about the episode, tell a couple of friends, and go back and listen to those other ones. And then the series after that fits in really well because it shows where the church goes after all of that and after the big controversy of Arianism. If there's something inside of that series that you think you'd like to hear more about, let me know. And I would definitely be willing to jump back into that time period. It's one of my favorites. And that's why I'm reintroducing it to you. So I hope you enjoy. And on with episode one, which is episode 39 of the series of the Arian Century. We're calling this next series the Arian Century. Arianism, or at least some sort of Arianism, would be on the ascendancy among the highest echelons of the Roman government. After 381, Nicene Trinitarian Christianity would be the official religious position of the Roman Empire, but it sure didn't look like that was the way things were going to happen, especially during the first few decades after the Council of Nicaea. A betting man in the middle of the 4th century definitely would have put his money on the ultimate triumph of some sort of subordinationist, Arian if you will, theology coming out on top. The other theme that's going to come up all the time in this series is the growing ecclesiastical power of the popes of Rome. The bishop of Rome always had a great deal of respect around the Christian world. His see was one of the three most important sees founded by Peter himself, and the city of Rome itself was obviously the center of the Roman world, less so, but still at least seemingly politically and culturally. 
That being said, the Bishop of Rome didn't have direct jurisdiction over anything more than his patriarchal see, which was large geographically, but did not cover every corner of the Roman Empire or Christendom. The power was that of first place of honor among the bishops. We're talking about a soft power up until the time of the Council of Nicaea. If the Pope of Rome wrote a letter, it carried weight because of the respect and honor given to the Bishop of Rome, not because he had any mechanism to enforce his will on other churches. Remember, we said each geographic area led by a major bishop was called a church. The bond that held all of these churches together was the belief that the other churches believed the right things and did things in the right way. That is why we say churches are in communion. These churches believe the communion, the most sacred ritual of Christianity, of other churches was valid. Maybe they differed on some practices, but that is what the synod or council system was for, to debate and discuss ideas in order to figure out what was correct and what was not. What we're going to see happen is that the ecclesiastical or religious powers of the popes are going to increase during this period. Researching this time period has changed my perspective on these issues. At first, I was always looking back from my vantage point in the 21st century. I was making comparisons and trying to tie together all the events of papal and Christian history to things that have happened in the modern day or at other times in the past. What I've had to do is, instead of looking at the events of the 4th century from 1,700 years away down the timeline, I've backed up and tried to view the events in their own context. We know that Arianism would be a dead letter in the next century or so. We also know papal authority and power, both secular and religious, will increase tremendously. What we should consider is that the people at this time, the 4th century, had no idea any of that was going to happen. Now that we've set the stage a bit, let's lay out what we're going to talk about today. We will take a look at what was happening around the Christian and Roman world in the first 25 years or so after the Council of Nicaea. This will include two popes and quite a bit of political intrigue. In the episodes on Eusebius of Nicomedia and Arius, episodes 33 and 29 respectively, we touched on some of the events that happened after the Council of Nicaea. The Christian church was full of politics, and the politics of the Roman Empire and the church were going to become completely interwoven. Really, at this point forward, you can't speak of church politics or secular politics. They would become one thing. In our discussions here, we're going to focus more on the church aspects and only discuss the secular side to contextualize what's going on. If you want to learn more about the secular side, you could always go back and listen to Mike Duncan's History of Rome podcast, or really any of many other sources. So let's start out in 325, right after the Council of Nicaea had concluded... In the immediate aftermath, Arius, Eusebius of Nicomedia, and a number of other subordinationists had been excommunicated and exiled. Eusebius of Nicomedia would work his way back into Constantine's good graces within a few short years. Arius remained in exile a few years longer, but was able to find refuge in his old stomping grounds in Palestine. As we've said before, Constantine's personal theological outlook much more closely mirrored the subordinationists, and in the years after Nicaea, he began to support that position more and more. In around 336 AD, Constantine ordered that Arius should be brought back into communion by the Bishop of Constantinople. All, the Bishop of Constantinople, was a firm Nicene Christian and wanted no part of that. It is said that he prayed that he wouldn't have to complete the ceremonies to bring Arius back into communion. The story goes, as Arius was walking through the courtyard to go to the church, to be received back into the church, he had a monumental intestinal rupture and died. Whether it was divine intervention or pure luck, Paul of Constantinople's bacon was saved and he didn't have to bring Arius back into the fold. 
Now, that was in 336, approximately 11 years after the Council of Nicaea. But believe me, that was not a quiet decade by any means. Eusebius of Nicomedia began what we dubbed the takedown, where Eusebius plotted through all the political machinations he could muster to remove many prominent Nicene Trinitarian supporting bishops. First, Eusebius knocked off Eustathius of Antioch in 330. This was an important win for Eusebius because it solidified the subordinationist control of the important patriarchal see of Antioch. Steve here. We are a member of the Parthenon Podcast Network featuring great shows like Richard Limbs, This American President, and other great shows. Go to ParthenonPodcast.com to learn more, and here is a quick word from our sponsors. As we're going to discover, the Synod of Antioch was going to be very important for Eusebius's plans. Back in Rome, Pope Sylvester was still alive and kicking all the way to 335 AD. Sylvester was one of the longest reigning popes of all time. His nearly 22 years sitting on the chair of St. Peter puts him solidly on the list of top 10 longest reigning popes. Even though Sylvester reigned for a long time, the records on his time as pope are extremely sketchy. Most of what has been attributed to Sylvester was based on later forgeries and legend. We did a whole show on him for episode 26. We included him in the anti-Nicene Pope series because even though he lived for at least a decade after the Council of Nicaea, it appears that Sylvester really didn't leave his mark on the events that happened after the Council. That doesn't mean his story was uninteresting by any means. If you haven't had a chance, go back and take a listen to episode 26. Or if you have listened, go listen again. Pope Sylvester died at the very end of 335, and with only a few short weeks, the next pope was elected. Pope Mark had a very short reign of only 10 months. Don't worry too much about Mark. We'll be able to wrap up his story pretty quickly. The Liber Pontificalis says very little about him. Mark was born in Rome City, and that's really all we know about his biographical background. The most interesting thing about his papal reign is that Mark is traditionally credited as bestowing a polyum to the Bishop of Ostia. The polyum is, at its most basic level, just an item of clerical clothing. A long, wide, white scarf worn about the neck which hangs down in front of the Episcopal vestments. The polyum, though, is much more than a cool article of clothing, much more than that. It represents the power of the highest ranks of Western Roman Catholic archbishops. Only a handful of bishops to this day are bestowed this form of clerical garment, and they are bestowed by the Pope himself. The bishops of Ostia from that day onward would have special authority in the Church. The most important of these authorities is the Bishop of Ostia as the person who consecrates new popes. Eventually, the Bishop of Ostia would evolve into the Dean of the College of Cardinals. The current, as of fall 2014 when this podcast is released, Dean of the College of Cardinals is Angelo Sodano. A famous recent holder of the office was Joseph Cardinal Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI. That's about all there is to say about Pope Mark's life. His remains were translated several times, meaning they were moved from one church to the next during the Middle Ages, finally to be put to rest in the Basilica of San Marco in Rome. After everything went down at the Council of Nicaea and the years after Nicaea, Pope Mark feels like kind of a letdown. Well, you can't say that for the next pope. After about four months of open sea, Julius I was elected to be the next pope. The Liber says he was born in Rome and his dad's name was Rusticus. Of course, it lists a bunch of churches he had constructed, etc. He did address an administrative matter about how the clergy would interact with the secular civil government. It appears this had something to do with the problem of church court jurisdiction overlapping with civil courts. And again, we're starting to get into that where the Roman and secular government and the church government are really going to start intertwining and overlapping. 
So really, in the big picture of Julius's 15-year reign from 337 AD to 352 AD, these minor administrative issues don't rank very high in the major events that would occur during Julius's reign. During Julius's reign, many of the big names of the day would pass on from this world. Constantine would die in 337. Eusebius of Nicomedia died in 341, not before he baptized Constantine, and Eusebius Pamphilus of Caesarea also died during Julius's papal reign. So as we will see, many new players would enter the stage in both the secular and religious realms. Ah, where to begin? A good place to begin is the big theme of Julius's papal reign, which was a major play by Julius to increase the religious power and authority of the Bishop of Rome. The Pope in Rome was the Bishop of the City of Rome itself, but also Metropolitan Bishop or Patriarch of the entire West. Let's recap what we're talking about with the West at that time. The Bishop of Rome's patriarchal territory was everything we would call the Western Roman Empire, Spain, North Africa, from Western Libya to the Atlantic Ocean... Britain, Gaul, the Balkans, Italy, and, interestingly, Greece. From early on, Rome and the other patriarchal sees had special powers and levels of respect over the other episcopal sees. No big deal. That was a tradition that went back almost to the beginning. Pope Julius really rattled a lot of cages, though, and got the whole ball rolling that the popes of Rome were a sort of court of last appeal in religious matters. Remember, don't look back and make judgments. Instead, place yourself in the middle of the 4th century and see what events look like from there. Nobody was talking papal supremacy over the entire church in every ecclesiastical matter, nor were the bishops and the Pope Julius talking about the Bishop of Rome having a universal authority over all other bishops. What Julius was saying was, because of the unique position of the bishops of Rome as both the main see of St. Peter and the metropolitan of the most important city in the empire, the see of Rome could judge controversies and other sees in the church. In a way, the see of Rome could act as an appeals court in religious matters from around Christendom. In just a minute, we'll get into how Julius developed this idea. But first, let's talk about power. Isn't that what everything comes down to? Power? The most important tool any bishop had to enforce his decisions over the people under his authority was the threat of excommunication. We've talked about excommunication before. It's the ultimate punishment the church can impose. It is cutting someone off from the communion, the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Here's the hitch, though. There was no ultimate or central authority to control who was in communion or who was out of communion. For example, the Church of Alexandria could excommunicate a clergyman or the member of the laity, but that person could go to Antioch and be accepted into communion there. The other Episcopal see probably shouldn't take someone into communion who had been excommunicated by another church, but there wasn't a mechanism to deal with that. When Constantine came to town and brought Roman civil law to the party, that was a game changer. When someone was excommunicated, they could also be banished or in later times put to death. Those are civil punishments, not ecclesiastical ones. Now, there are definite examples of theocracies where the lines between religious authority and secular authority are completely blurred. This was not the situation in the 4th century Roman Empire, though. The bishops were the religious authority, and Constantine was the civil authority. Constantine did put pressure on bishops at times to fulfill his wishes in the religious domain. Sometimes bishops did follow Constantine's lead. Oftentimes, they did not. On the other hand, no bishop of anywhere was going to tell Constantine what to do. Constantine did what he wanted to do, and that was that. This is another reason why Constantine may have been more inclined toward the Arian position. The Arians were much more comfortable with an emperor being the ultimate authority, religious and secular, on earth. To the Arians, God was a much more remote character. 
The Nicene Trinitarian position was that God, through a completely equal Son, Jesus, and Holy Spirit, was much more involved in the day-to-day business of the world. The Nicene group presented a very different view of how the state and religion fit into the grand scheme of things. Sure, the Nicene Trinitarians didn't believe in a separation of church and state like we do today, not by a long shot, but they did believe that the church operated in a different realm than the state, and the church had ultimate authority in its own realm. So keep all those opposing ideas in mind as we get back to Pope Julius and how he attempted to exercise Roman papal authority. The East was basically one gigantic, roiling theological battlefield. Everyone was accusing everyone of calumny, blasphemy, and attempting to subvert the Nicene Creed. We're all pretty familiar with the issues at hand. But one thing to consider is that all sides, subordinationist, orthodox, and the groups in between all felt they were holding up and defending the creed of Nicaea. Eusebius of Nicomedia was a political animal, as much as he was a theological one, and I believe that he wanted orthodox bishops out of their sees because it definitely bolstered his theological positions, but also... Every Orthodox bishop Eusebius of Nicomedia got bumped out further served to increase his political power. During the mid-330s AD, Eusebius convened a number of local synods at various cities in the east and was able to have a number of major bishops deposed and excommunicated. These bishops weren't going to take these depositions lying down, though. I'll refrain from bombarding you with all the names of the deposed bishops, but two of the most important bishops were Athanasius of Alexandria and Marcellus of Ancyra. So what were the charges laid against Marcellus of Ancyra and Athanasius of Alexandria anyways? Did Eusebius just cook up some BS complaints against these guys and then get them excommunicated through friendly synods? Well, in many ways, yes. Marcellus, Athanasius, and the other bishops who were deposed solidly and unapologetically supported the Orthodox party. That wasn't going to score them any points with Eusebius, but there were some other reasons for their depositions as well. We'll start with Marcellus first. The charge against Marcellus was that he was not a Trinitarian at all, but he went further and was a Sabellian. In other words, to Marcellus of Ancyra, The three parts of the Trinity were not actually three separate persons, but just one Godhead, which appeared to be three different persons by the viewer. The Eusebian party and the subordinationists in general's main argument against the Trinitarians was that they were Sibelians. If we consider Marcellus of Ancyra for a moment, we can see that the Eusebians may have had a point that he was a Sibelian. Other writers, including Trinitarians, thought that he may have been a Sibelian. Pope Julius and his bishops were going to come to their own conclusions on this charge. Athanasius of Alexandria is a different story altogether. As we progress, we are going to see Athanasius is going to be deposed and exiled so many times, his cathedral must have had revolving doors. The charges thrown against Athanasius had nothing much to do with theology and more to do with the fact that Athanasius rubbed seemingly everyone the wrong way. If you read writers like Charles Freeman, you'd think Athanasius was the biggest jerk of all times. Being unbending and not a team player was probably the biggest reason Athanasius was in scotch with the emperors and other prelates for his entire career. The charges that got Athanasius the boot this first time was that he mistreated the Maletians and he threatened to interrupt the grain supply between Egypt and Constantinople. Even if that charge was completely cooked up by Eusebius of Nicomedia, Constantine was not going to let something like that pass for a second. The grain supply was not going to be threatened. Even the mention of that was enough to get somebody exiled at best. We're going to be hearing a lot about Athanasius during this series, so he will definitely get his own episode so we can learn more about him and his background. 
Oh, can I get your attention for just a second? A great way to support the History of the Papacy podcast is by joining us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash history of the papacy. Your support on Patreon goes a long way to help keep the history of the papacy sustainable for a long time in the future. There are four tiers of support on Patreon, Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Rome. Each of these tiers represents one of the traditional patriarchates of early Christianity. There are many great benefits for supporting the show on Patreon. The most important, though, is being included on the history of the papacy diptychs. In traditional Christianity, the diptychs are the list of bishops commemorated in their order of precedence. The sooner you sign up on Patreon, the higher you will be on the lists of the history of the papacy patrons. Very soon after these bishops were deposed and exiled, they went to Rome for redress of their grievances. Here's the controversial part. Did Marcellus and Athanasius go to Rome because Rome held an ancient precedence as a sort of court of final appeals on theological matters? It's possible That is the position the Roman clergy under the leadership of the Pope took. Or it could be that Athanasius and the other assorted bishops simply had nowhere else to go. Rome was the last and most important patriarchal see left in the Christian world that was still Trinitarian. Everywhere else was Arian, or trending Arian by that time. This fact provided Rome with an opportunity to assert its power in the theological battles that raged in the East. Julius reviewed the charges against Athanasius and Marcellus through his own Roman synod, and they found the charges against them to be without merit. Julius wrote to the East and said Athanasius and Marcellus were fine by his reckoning and proclaimed he, Julius, had the right to hear the appeals of decisions made by other synods. The predominantly Greek bishops of the East were like, who the hell does this guy Julius think he is? They said the bishop of Rome was certainly honored as a patriarch, but that was about it. That place of honor didn't give the Pope of Rome any other level of authority over the bishops of any other synod. The Emperor of the West, Constans, one of Constantine the Great's many sons with ridiculously similar names, met with Athanasius and was going to hold a council at Milan to visit the accusations further. But Constans agreed with his brother, Constantius, Emperor of the East, to have a larger council at Sardica, which is now modern Sofia, the capital city of Bulgaria. The date of this council is disputed because nobody seems to have written down the actual date. So you have to try and zero in on the date based on other events. Be that as it may, the date is somewhere in the neighborhood of 344. It's said that 96 Western bishops attended, with some number less than that of Eastern bishops in attendance. Good old, I mean very old at this point, Hosius of Cordoba, was the chairman of the council. Two papal legates were also involved. Events did not go well from the beginning at Sardica. Almost as soon as the council was convened, the Arian bishops picked up their toys and reconvened at Philopolis, about a hundred miles or so down the road from Sardica, which is actually now the second largest city in Bulgaria. At that point, both camps just went ahead and did their own thing. This was a complete train wreck and went against what the emperors Constans and Constantius were looking for out of the council. They wanted a universal council which could hammer out the issues between the two camps and make some peace. What happened was that the Trinitarian council, which was still going on at Sardica, reaffirmed the Nicene Creed and reinstalled Athanasius as the Bishop of Alexandria. Constantius seems to have accepted this result, maybe grudgingly, but after the bishop who was installed after Athanasius was dethroned died, Athanasius was allowed back into Alexandria. The Council of Sardica also beefed up a number of canons against bishops moving around to seek better positions, or being moved to other sees by more powerful bishops, basically rearranging the chess pieces for political reasons. You can probably imagine who the person the Western bishops had in mind with these canons. 
Eusebius of Nicomedia was more than likely dead by the time of these two councils, but Eusebius definitely casted a long shadow on the history of Christianity. You could say the Arian bishops who went to Philopolis disagreed with what happened at Sardica, so they, in effect, doubled down on Arianism. These bishops developed a creed that said Jesus was an unlike or completely different substance than that of God the Father. The bishops at Philopolis even went as far as excommunicating all of the bishops that disagreed with them, which by default included Pope Julius. These actions led to the creation of a new and improved Arian party, rebranded as the Anomians, based on the Greek word for unlike. They were saying that God the Father and Jesus were more than just different. They were completely unlike each other. We'll be talking about this group a lot very soon. The results of all this back and forth and competing councils was the followers of the two main theological positions became even more entrenched. Some bishops who believed in positions that Jesus and God the Father were similar were completely turned off by the new and improved Arian position. One such bishop was Basil of Ancyra, the guy who filled in after Marcellus was deposed, who was considered an Arian because he did not support the term homoousius. But what he had a problem with was the actual term homoousius. He felt that the word was completely inappropriate because it couldn't be found anywhere in the scriptures. Basil's theological position, that was Jesus and God the Father were similar, even very similar, but not exactly one in essence. This idea or theological position could have been a bridge between the warring factions. As we go on, we will see how the various factions with a new set of leaders evolve in the setting of a Roman Empire that was headed for a very rough end of the 4th and 5th centuries. Before we go, let us commemorate the Patreon patrons on the History of the Papacy Diptychs. We have, at the Alexandria level, Roberto, William B., Brian, Christina, Augustus, Judy, and Max. At the Constantinople level, we have Dapo, Paul, Justin, Lana, John, Steve, and Sean, who are all magnificent, and reaching that ultimate power and prestige, that of the Sea of Rome, we have Peter the Great, Amma the Great, Jeffrey the Great, Frederick the Great, and Jim the Great. With that, I hope you've enjoyed this piece of the mosaic of the history of the Popes of Rome and Christian Church. 